um, happy to welcome Nathaniel Grove to this um, webinar, this ongoing series of webinars that we're having as part of the Royal Society of Chemistry um, Chemical Education Research Group. So um, Nathaniel has been um, doing quite a lot of interesting work and we um, we're very happy that he accepted our invitation to speak. Um, he's got quite an interesting pedigree as, in terms of chemistry education research because he did his PhD with um, Stacey Larry Bretz at Miami University in Ohio. And I think I'm right in saying you were Stacey's first student, so um, extra uh -huh. extra credentials. Um, and then postdoc with Melanie Cooper. Um, and your interests, I think, generally uh, align with meaningful learning in organic chemistry uh, and interests, especially looking at cognitive load. And I think that's uh, the topic that we're very excited to hear about tonight. So I'll pass you over to Nathan, but we'll just first introduce um, now Nikki Kaiser. Um, and Nikki will be chairing the session officially. So I thought it'd be nice to have somebody else picking out the questions that will be asked. So Nikki's from um, Norwich in here in the UK. Um, she's a school teacher, but she's also a research lead for schools in Norwich. Uh, looking at activating evidence-based approaches in schools. And she leads a particularly dynamic group of people um, interested in cognitive load, interested in cognitive science generally. So I thought this was a really nice match. So hopefully you won't hear much from me tonight. Um, Nathan will be stopping about halfway through the talk uh, and then at the end. So we'll have two sessions of questions uh, and Nikki will be um, facilitating the questions at those stages. So you'll get to see and hear from her in a while. So I'm going to shut up and pass over to you, um, Nathan, and we're very looking, really looking forward to hearing you uh, speak. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it's a, it's a real pleasure to be able to join you um, this evening, your time. Um, I have to say I was really humbled um, to, to be extended this, this privilege to be able to speak with you this afternoon. Um, and so what I'd like to do is to talk a little bit about some of the research that my group has been engaged in um, over the course of the last five years or so um, that's dealt with, as you'll see, I'm learning more about the, the interface and the interplay between cognitive load and students' use of, of representations, and, and maybe more in general, their, their learning of, of chemistry. Um, so before I start, um, I, I have to start with the acknowledgments. Um, none of this research would, would have been possible without the really great students that um, I've been able to work with over the last several years. Um, the, the, the participants, um, as many of you know, who conduct chemistry education research or science education research, um, we need people to actually help us um, to, to gather data from. So I want to thank the, the students and the faculty participants. Um, a big thank you to my department for, for being supportive. And, and finally, to um, the National Science Foundation for um, supporting this, this work um, through various uh, grants and, and um, funds. So, uh, one of the main textbooks here in the United States um, talks about the fact that, that chemistry is the, the central science. In fact, that's the, the name of the, the, the textbook, Chemistry, a Central Science. And if you think about it, it it's true. Um, chemistry sits at the nexus point um, between the, the biological and the physical sciences. Um, but I would argue, um, and others have argued, that we also um, suffer from what we might call a central problem. Um, so if I were a biology professor and, and say that I'm teaching an introductory biology course in um, cellular respiration or something like that, um, when I get to talking about the role of the, the mitochondria in the process, I, I might be able to show my students a, a picture like this, where they can actually see um, the, the organelle that we're talking about. Um, we could go into the lab if we're talking about mitosis and we could see um, the actual division process as, a, as it progresses. Um, but as a chemist, I, I have a, a problem with that. I can't show my students a corresponding picture of an atom or a molecule. And as chemists, we've, we've gotten very creative um, in studying molecular and atomic structure. And so we've, we've focused on, on things like this, right? So we've um, dealt with spectroscopy. We've, we've looked at other forms of microscopy. But the reality is, even though um, let me turn the pointer on. Even though these guys look like pictures, in, in reality, what we're talking about are computer-generated um, interpretations of data. So even these aren't pictures. Um, and so to, to help students with this issue, um, as chemists, we've devised any number 
of what we might call symbolically based systems of notation. Um, these are just a few of them. We, we literally could have slide after slide after slide with other examples of, of notational forms. And they, they start off fairly simplistic here where, you know, we're just showing atoms as, as spheres. Um, despite the fact that this one uh, has tons of misconceptions that uh, associated with it, right, we begin to get the sense that there is some structure underlying the spheres. And then we move into um, things like Lewis structures, um, chair conformers, boats, Newman projections. We then start adding in arrows to talk about how electrons are flowing during the process. So there, there are, again, dozens and dozens and dozens of these different systems of notation. Some of them uh, much more simplistic than others. Um, one of the issues, though, here is that um, not only are there a lot of them, but we, we, we really do expect students to use these representations with a fair degree of fidelity fairly quickly. Um, so these are all representations that, at least here in the United States, um, our students will see within the first maybe two or three um, semesters of their study of, of chemistry. And, and again, there's lots more. Um, these systems of, of notation, however, are, are quite useful because um, we would contend that really the essence of learning chemistry um, is the ability to um, take macroscopic um, phenomena and ma macroscopic um, properties in the world around us and connect those properties and explain them using atomic and molecular structure. And these, these symbolically based systems of notation are absolutely critical in that connection process. Right? So if, if students can do this even in a rudimentary sense, um, I think we can say that, that we've been successful. Um, now let's look at one of these processes. So I have an example here. Um, Three organic molecules, um, ethanol, propane, and chloromethane. They're about the same size, and yet if you look at their boiling points, um, they differ quite a bit to the point where two of these are, are gases at room temperature, one of these um, is, is a liquid. And so we might ask an introductory chemistry student um, to explain this. Why would you predict that something like ethanol um, would have a relatively higher boiling point than something like chloromethane or something like, like propane. And so let's take this apart. Let's dissect it and think about the steps that you might need to go through in order to, to answer that sort of question. Um, so this is actually adapted um, from a, a paper that uh, Melanie Cooper and, and Sonia Underwood had published in SERP a few years ago, and I encourage you to, to, to look at it if you're interested in this topic. Um, but let's say we start with the, the, the chemical formula. Um, this is great, um, but there's not a whole lot of information that you can pull out from um, knowing that something like ethanol has a, has a formula of C2H6O. Um, the very first thing that you're going to need to do is um, convert it into a, into a Lewis structure. We need to get some sort of structural information. Um, once we have the Lewis structure, we can then begin thinking about um, the three-dimensionality of the molecule because even though on, on paper it's, it's two dimensions, we know that, that that's not the case in reality. Once we have that three-dimensional um, picture, we could begin to then analyze the molecule and look for large differences in electronegativity. Right? We need to think about the molecular polarity of, of, of the compound. Um, and so hopefully the student recognizes that there's a very large difference in electronegativity between the oxygen and the hydrogen. Um, the oxygen part is partially negative, the hydrogen end partially positive. And so using this, you could come up with um, something like this, where um, hopefully the student recognizes, again, that um, the oxygen end is, is uh, electron rich, the, the hydrogen end is electron deficient. Right? So we then get to the point where hopefully um, the student then recognizes, well, based on um, the structure, the molecular polarity, um, molecules of, FA, uh, of ethanol will probably engage in hydrogen bonding with each other. And then they have to remember, well, hydrogen bonding in, in the, the, the scheme um, is one of the stronger intermolecular forces. Right? And so only at this point can the student then come to, to the, a conclusion where you say, in comparison to other organic molecules, um, ethanol should have a relatively high boiling. 
So if you if you just look at that, we've got what one, two, three, four, five, let's say six different steps. And the reality is it's not just six steps because many of these arrows obscure the fact that we have sub-steps that the student has to go to get from point A to point B. So um, if we look just at, at the process from going from the formula to the Lewis structure, you know, typically this is a, we teach this as a rules-based approach. There's several different um, rules that the students have to follow. Maybe they start with a, a tally and then place the central atoms and then the atoms around the periphery start forming bonds. But there are multiple steps. And so it's not um, unreasonable to, to assume that this sort of process, which for many of us as experts seems second nature, to a student is, is anything but. And it's very, very cognitively complex. Uh, and so this sort of leads to um, one of the, the guiding research goals or, or questions in my group. And, and that is, what role does cognitive load play in students' ability to construct and use representations of chemical structure? Because if, if we go back for a second to that slide, if you can't take the formula and convert it into a Lewis structure, the rest of this process doesn't happen. And so you have to be able to make that connection and do so successfully. So before I go any farther, I want to take a moment and um, just talk a little bit about cognitive load. Michael had indicated that um, I could probably expect a, a wide range of backgrounds um, in, in the presentation today. And so I don't want to assume that, that everyone knows what, what I'm talking about when I say cognitive load. So um, let's just take a moment and, and talk about that. There are not any number of different models uh, for, for learning that are out there. And I think one of the ones that, that best describes um, the role of, of cognitive load is information processing. So every moment of every day, uh, we are being constantly bombarded by stimuli. Um, and, and the reality is, if we actually perceived and were consciously aware of all of those stimuli, um, quite likely we would be completely overwhelmed. Uh, we, would, we would sit in our beds, um, we would be curled up in fetal positions, we would not be able to function. And so the very first part of, of the information processing model is what's typically called a perception filter. And as the name suggests, the, the perception filter's job is to filter out and to determine what is important and then should move on and what we can safely ignore. So let me give you an example that, that you might be um, familiar with. Um, at some point in the past, you, you all have probably purchased um, a, a, a new cologne or perfume, or you've changed um, laundry detergents or fabric softeners. And, and after you do that for the first couple of days, um, you are acutely aware of that scent. And then all of a sudden, one day, it just, you don't smell it anymore. And it's not that that scent isn't there, it's that your perception filter has been picking up on this particular stimulus for several days, and you're still alive. Nothing's happened. Um, you're still safe and sound. And so your perception filters learned it's probably OK if I ignore this stimulus and, and it drops out. You compare that to the smell of smoke. Um, we know, based on our prior experience, that as soon as we smell smoke, that's a good um, signal that there could be fire. And if we don't attend to that immediately, um, we could be burned. Even worse, we could, we could die. Um, and so this is how the perception filter works. It's, it's based on the, the prior knowledge, what can be safely um, dropped out and what needs to move on and, and attended to. What does move on moves into um, what's called the working memory space. And this is really where um, the learning process occurs. It's, a, it's at this point um, that the learner becomes consciously aware of whatever the stimulus is. And in an ideal world, what you hope is going to happen is the student will say, OK, well, this new information that I'm being taught right now, that's related to concept x, y, and z that I learned about last week or last semester or whatever the case is. And so what happens is the, the learner brings that information from long-term storage back into working memory. Um, hope the connections are made between the, the new information and the old information. And then as a connected whole, 
um, this then moves back into the long-term storage for, for um, longer-term um, memory. Now, there are other ways of getting things into long-term storage. Um, many students elect to, um, especially in, in subjects like chemistry, um, elect to just rotely memorize information. And this is a brute force method of getting information into the long-term storage. The problem with this is that there, there are few connections that are made between the underlying cognitive structure and, and that new information that the student has just memorized. And so very quickly, um, the student typically forgets about whatever it is that they've just memorized. And then as I indicated before, there's this feedback loop between what's in long-term storage and the perception filter, right? So um, based on our prior experiences, we know fire is dangerous, and so that feeds into the, the perception filter. So the important part here now is at least since the 1950s, we've known that there appears to be a limit to the amount of information um, that can fit in working memory at one time, the amount of information that the learner can process simultaneously. Um, back in 1956, when, when George Miller first published um, his work, he called it the magic number, seven plus or minus two pieces of information. Uh, research that was done in, the, in, the, in the, the late 90s, early 2000s, seemed to suggest maybe seven was too much, and it's four pieces of information. Uh, more recent research um, suggests that it's not a finite number, but that we have a finite um, set of resources that we can dynamically assign based on um, how cognitively complex the individual pieces of information are. What, what, whatever model and is, is true, um, no one um, disagrees that there appears to be this limit on working memory. And as working memory begins to fill, a load is placed on it. And so that's what the, the cognitive load is that we're talking about. How much information can um, a, a particular learner process simultaneously in working memory? And you get to a point where it exceeds the capacity and the student then becomes cognitively overloaded. So that's, that's what I'm referring to when, when I speak about cognitive load. Now, if we're going to explore um, the relationship between cognitive load and students' learning of chemistry, we probably have to have some way of actually measuring the load. And so if you go to the research literature, um, typically you see three different techniques. Um, what are called performance techniques? These are the first. Um, this is where you use performance on a secondary technique, uh, a secondary task to determine the load associated with the primary task. The second are what are typically called subjective techniques. Um, these are typically survey-based. It could be a written survey. It could be an oral survey, where at the end of, of the experience, you ask the, the, the participant, OK, how load-inducing do you think that was? How complex? Um, how difficult? There are different ways that you could phrase this. Um, and then the third are what are called physiological techniques. And these are the ones that um, we've decided to use in, in our work. Uh, so the way these work um, is as the cognitive load increases, as the student is asked to process more information simultaneously, the learner begins to stress. And when you stress, there are a whole host of physiological events that, are, that occur. So for example, um, there are measurable changes in brain activity. Um, if you look at alpha wave um, signals, they're, they're de depressed. Um, you begin to sweat. So you could measure galvanic skin response. You begin to blink more frequently and the size of your pupil changes. And finally, your heart rate goes up. And so if you can find some way of measuring anyone or any combination of these physiological metrics, you can then relate that back to the overall load that the activity was inducing on, on working memory. And so for a number of reasons, we, we elected to go, at least initially, with, with heart rate. Um, there is some literature to suggest that, that this is a valid and reliable means of measuring load, but none of this um, had been done in, in chemistry education. And so um, before we sort of dove in there head first and said, let's do this and try to study um, phenomena of interest, we, we, we said, okay, let's take a step back and be cautious and make sure that, that this technique 
actually will work. So we conducted a series of validation um, experiments um, to, to guide us in that realm. So what we did is we purchased um, a set of, of clinical grade heart rate monitors. These are very similar to what you might buy um, if, if you like to track your, your heart rate when you're exercising. Um, they attach to the participants um, using a Velcro, Velcro strap um, to their arm. So um, depending on um, what they were wearing and, and how comfortable they are either here in the upper arm or here on the forearm, um, both work. Um, these are wireless. Um, they, they transmit data through Bluetooth um, to an iPod Touch. So we, we use iPod Touch as, a, as our collection device. And on the iPod Touch, uh, we use a commercially available um, exercise app. And this particular app um, will record the heart rate from the, the monitor once a second. Um, and it's great because uh, you can push a couple of buttons. It, it saves it as a CSV file, attaches it to an email, and then it's very easy to then analyze the, the results from a session um, in, in Excel or SPSS. Um, we designed a series of what we call cognitive load progression activities. There were three of these. Um, and I have one example here. These were, um, this is the progression that we designed for, the, for organic chemistry. Um, there was a progression for balancing equations and a progression for uh, Lewis structures. And so the idea here is that the first problem in each one of the, the progressions, so in this case labeled A, um, has been designed to be of, of low load. So this was an example where students were being asked to determine the stereochemistry and to work with stereochemistry of organic molecules, so to assign R and S. Um, in this case, um, all of the groups are explicitly drawn. Um, the hydrogen, the lowest priority group, is, is oriented away from, from the viewer, so they don't need to do any sort of mental uh, rotation or manipulation. In B, um, that we do have the, the hydrogen that is not shown, and again, now in this case, um, it's oriented towards the viewer, and so now there's some rotation that, that has to occur. So we would predict that this would be more load-inducing than A. And then problem C, let's actually do something with um, a, a chiral compound. And so some of our previous research um, suggested that um, substitution and elimination reactions were something that students struggled mightily with. And we think part of it is because of the, the, the load associated with keeping everything separate and all of the pieces that, that you need to attend to. Um, and so this we would then predict to be of, of the highest load. And so the other two progression activities were very similar. A low load, an intermediate load, and then a high load problem. So based on this design, um, we came up with three hypotheses. So number one, um, these problems that have been intentionally designed to be of higher intrinsic cognitive load should induce a greater change in heart rate than those that have been designed of lesser intrinsic load. So in other words, going back to our progression activities, the change in, in, in heart rate for problem A should be less than it is for B, which should be less than C. Number two, if we have two groups, um, chemistry faculty who served as experts and more novice students, in this case these were organic chemistry students, the change in heart rate for the same problem will be less for the experts than for the, the less experienced chemistry students. And part of this has to do um, with the development of expertise. Um, one of the things that comes along with that is experts begin to chunk information. And so what counts as a piece um, is actually different for a, a, a novice than, than an expert. And then thirdly, there's, there's some research that would suggest that there should be a significant positive correlation between time on task and overall change in heart rate. So the idea here is um, these problems that are more load inducing tend to be more complex. If the problem is more complex, then it's, it's, a, it's a good bet that the, that the participant's going to spend more time on that problem than, than one that's less complex. So let's look at, at some, some data here. Um, so just so that you know what you're looking at, um, here on the y-axis, and this will remain the same throughout the presentation um, when I show you some other results after the, the break, 
Um, this is change in heart rate expressed as a percent. Um, along here, these are the um, nine problems that were part of the three um, cognitive load progression activities. So the first three, these are the balancing equations. The next three, these are the Lewis structures. And then the final three, those are the organic chemistry ones that I showed you um, earlier. Um, one, those are the low load, two, intermediate, three, high load. Um, we look at the data, right? So the teal diamonds, those are the organic chemistry students. And the white squares, those are the chemistry faculty, our stand-in for experts. So if you think back now to the, um, the hypotheses, um, number one would seem to be confirmed. You see a very nice pattern where um, lowest change in heart rate, intermediate, high, low, medium, high, low, medium, high. See the exact same thing for the, for the chemistry faculty, low, medium, high, low, medium, high, low, medium, high. So that would seem to be confirmed. Number two, um, in, in eight of the nine instances, um, the chemistry faculty um, did have a statistically significantly lower change in heart rate than the chemistry students. So overall, that would seem to be um, confirmed as well. And then finally, if we look at um, time on task versus change in heart rate, um, again, we see very strong correlations um, and very significant correlations. Um, so that would seem to confirm that um, hypothesis as well. So at the end of this, really what came about is um, really what the literature would suggest, and that is that, that looking at change in heart rate can be a, a valid and reliable means of um, getting towards um, changes in cognitive load. Um, so with, with that, um, I want to take just a couple of minutes, and, and Nikki, if, if we have some, some questions at this point, I'd be more than happy to, um, to answer those. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, good. Um, first of all, thank you ever so much, and uh, a comment here from Madeline saying nice results. I agree. That was a really, a really clear graph that you just showed there. Um, I'm reading as I speak here, because this one's just come through. Actually, before I ask that, I'm just interested to know, um, you talked about um, the, the working memory and chunking and um, I was wondering what kind of things do you think are taking up the working memory and how much does chunking come into play? How much was it just general familiarity with um, structures and, and being able to draw a familiar structure from the memory as, as opposed right. to having to construct it. So what's the balance between the two, do you think? I, I think a lot of what's in working memory is probably extraneous information. Um, but, it, it, but at the same time, um, the reality is, as a, as, a, as, a, as a novice learner, you don't know that. Right? So going back to that example that I outlined with the, the boiling points and the, the intermolecular forces, um, as, as an expert, you know, we immediately see that OH and, and that's it, right? So we, we can explain that. And we know, um, at least for something like ethanol, that's going to be the major contributor. Um, and we don't even need to think about what the structure of that R group piece is, right? Um, but, for, but a student doesn't know that. Um, and so that, that takes time. So I think, I think a lot of it is um, information that may not be um, relevant or, or useful to, the, to solving some of the problems, but you don't know that at that time. Um, it, that's something that develops with, with experience. Um, so I, I think that it, it, it's, a, it's a good mix. OK. Um, and so, so the, the point you were making about the um, you can't just memorize things. Um, there, there have to be connections made, so that there's a balance between things that you have to draw, I guess, from the memory, and mm -hmm. things that you have to still be able to understand and construct. And it's that balance changes, does it, as you become more experienced? Is that something you you noticed that that I'm wondering how much was drawn from memory and how much was was actually um, the connections that they had built over the years, I guess. 
I, I would say some of it definitely was built from from memory. Um, so um, if if we go back to um, the, the some of the structures that stu for example, the, some of the the cognitive load progression activities, um, some of the structures, especially the the one that was intended to be of low load um, for for the experts, and I suspect for some of the students. Um, it was a memorized structure, um, something like water or ammonia, um, where the, you just know what it is. Um, yeah. But there are, there are definite, um, and, and this is the same with some of the studies I'll talk with after we're done with the questions, um, we've also selected problems that um, are definitely um, not just um, memorized. Um, and, and quite frankly, if I go back to this slide, um, for example, we, we think that, for example, that's what's going on here, yeah. um, is that it wasn't so much the fact that the, the faculty were having difficulty drawing the Lewis structures, um, it's that they were able to draw several potentially valid Lewis structures because this was something they'd never seen before. Yeah. And they were trying to use the, the what they knew about um, the chemistry of these compounds to, to predict, okay, this one actually could exist, um, this one doesn't. This doesn't make any sense from a structural perspective or a stability pers perspective. It will degrade over very quickly. Um, so some of these definitely are very automatic, memorized responses. Others, um, not so much, that, that it did require um, some actual thinking and processing um, so. And um, thank you. And a question from Jenny Burnham um, saying really interesting stuff. I, uh, she says, I have a question related to cognitive load and stress in exam conditions, because it's that time of year. Um, if we write exam questions that have a higher cognitive load, such as a long preamble setting out the question, are we then increasing the cognitive load on the student and increasing the stress levels on that student? So is that something to take into account, I guess, when writing the uh, question? Definitely. Um, you know, one of the things I'll talk about at the end is I think we need to be very conscious of instructional design, um, and that includes testing, um, because you have a finite set of cognitive resources, and it takes time to replenish those resources. And so if you've completely blown the student away um, with with a, a very high load problem, it quite likely is going to impact performance um, down the road. So it, it definitely is something that we need to be aware of, and and I'll and I'll talk about that that a little bit more later on. So definitely. Okay, thank you. And um, there was a second question there. So does increasing the stress levels on students um, and feedback? Um, oh, sorry, I'm not understanding this. Correctly, I'll come back to that one. This one here, um, why was the second test set, um, why didn't that follow the linear trend, someone's asked here. The second test set didn't follow the linear trend. I think you talked about that a minute ago, but you want to... Yeah, right. So, so what we think is happening is um, quite likely the, the low, the, the, the part of, the, the, there's two pieces of going on here. Number one, there's the actual load of putting together the structure, but then the, the faculty are pulling other information in from long-term storage that are taking, that's taking up room in the working memory that's increasing the, the overall load. Um, so if, if that's what the, what's being asked, that that's what we think is going on. Um, we, we actually had some respondents, some of the faculty when, um, when we were in the interviews actually say, okay, so now, which one of the, the, these makes sense? Um, and so it was clear that they were going through their, um, their the, what they knew about chemical structure and organic chemistry and things like that to pick out ones that could potentially make sense to them and ones that didn't. So I think we think that's what's going on. Um, so. Thank you very much. Um, can I just ask one final very brief question before you move on? Um, Nicola Kiernan has just said, you know, you're, there's a direct causal connection um, proposed between heart rate and uh, cognitive load. Um, do you think there might be other factors that contribute to this? Are there any that you can identify? Right. Yeah, de definitely. Definitely there are other things that, that go into um, 
changes in, in heart rate. Um, uh, you know, one of the things that, that we know is um, if, you, if you're embarrassed, um, heart rate can go up. Um, if you are taking certain medications that can play with, with heart rate, if, you, if you've had caffeine, um, you know, a, a couple of hours before, or, or you've exercised. Um, so there's, there's likely more going on here than just cognitive load. Now, one of the things that we try to do um, is, at least with things like the, the caffeine and the exercising, um, we ask students about that when, when, they, when they get um, to us for, the, for their participation. Um, and if they tell us they've, they've had caffeine or exercised um, within three hours, we then reschedule them. We make it clear in the scheduling emails, you know, we ask them not to do that. Um, but, but there definitely are other things going on here. And, and the best that we can try to do is to mitigate some of those things. Um, so as you'll see when I talk about some of the results at the end, um, we never actually um, look at the results for, for the first problem that we give students. The first problem is always a throwaway question because we know that, that they're nervous, um, they don't know exactly what to expect, and, and that could spike the heart rate. Um, so we, we try our best to take those sorts of things into account um, with the recognition that there, there, there is more going on here than just load. Thank you. We're really looking forward to hearing the rest of it now, so I'll let you carry on and collect some more questions for later, if that's okay. Sure, thank you. Thank you. All right. So um, at this point, as I was saying, um, we felt like we had a, a valid and reliable method so we could begin to actually study some of these um, issues related to, um, to load and, and students' use of structure. So the first one that we were interested in is, you know, if you think about Lewis structures, they're not all created equal. Some of them are very straightforward, something like methane, for example, or water. Others are much more structurally complex. And so are there certain structural characteristics, like the introduction of a double bond or a triple bond or multiple central atoms, for example, that induce um, changes in cognitive load? Um, so we were interested in exploring that. And, and secondly, what effect does the format have? Um, so I'm, I'm, I can't speak to what the, the educational environment is like in the UK and, and in Europe in general, but at least here in the United States, Many um, introductory chemistry courses make use of some form of, of online homework. Um, and so each one of these homework systems has its own um, structure drawing um, palette. And so what does that do to the overall load? Um, do we have certain um, formats that are inducing large amounts of extraneous load? Because that's important to, to, to keep in mind. So let's look at the, the first one. Um, so again, starting with our same sort of experimental design, um, our heart rate monitors, transmitting data through Bluetooth to an iPod Touch, running a commercially available exercise app, um, we selected um, 10 formulas that we asked the, the participants to create Lewis structures from. Um, these were selected because, as you'll notice, um, they represent a range of difficulties. So um, fairly straightforward ones that, that might be very memorized and automatic like water and, and ammonia um, to much more complex ones. Um, there are structures here that have multiple central atoms that, are, are, that involve charge species um, that require the creation of double or triple bonds. Um, and then finally, there, there's at least one example here um, of, of an expanded octet. And so what we did um, is we asked three groups of students to draw these 10 Lewis structures for us. Um, we were monitoring their heart rate as they did so. The, so the way this worked is each, uh, each formula was listed at the top of a piece of paper, um, and we would give this to the student. They would draw their Lewis structure on the, the rest of the paper at the bottom, and when they were finished, take back the, um, the, the paper and then give them the second one that had the next formula at the top. Um, we did this with uh, General Chemistry 2 students, um, a group of about 60 organic chemistry students, and students enrolled in, in our senior seminar course. So these are students that were within a semester of graduating uh, with a bachelor's degree in chemistry. So we analyzed uh, the results using a, a, a multiple regression analysis. 
And the idea here um, is that we can look at the contributing, how each structural complexity contributes um, to the overall load and, and whether that contribution is statistically significant. And so if you, um, if you look, not surprising, um, the introduction of almost any structural complexity um, from um, multiple central atoms to um, charged species, et cetera, seem to um, induce a significant increase in the cognitive load for um, the general chemistry students. The exception to that uh, were the, the expanded octets. And in addition, as we moved um, to more experienced students, um, those, those issues seem to mitigate themselves. So there were still a, a few structural um, complexities that seem to induce load for the, the organic chemistry students, so in particular um, the introduction of multiple central atoms or atoms from beyond the second period of, of the periodic table. But by the time they reached um, senior year um, and were getting ready to graduate with, with a degree in chemistry, um, the introduction of, of the structural complexities didn't seem to make a difference for them. So on the one hand, you look at this and you say, okay, this is good news, right? We're seeing progress. Um, because the last thing that you would want to see is um, they started off with all of these structural complexities inducing load, and they were still all inducing load four years later. Um, so we do see progress, which is a good thing. Um, and secondly, it, it I think provides um, some really good feedback for where perhaps we need to think about spending more time um, in, in our introductory chemistry classes. Because if these issues still are present um, with the organic chemistry students, um, that would seem to suggest that they haven't really developed the strategies that they need um, to, to, to work with this. So um, we, we need to think about how can we help them develop these strategies to deal with multiple central atoms and, and atoms beyond the second period. The third thing that I would point out here, um, and this one's a little less encouraging, um, is at least here in the U.S. and, and in particular at, at our institution here at, at UNCW, um, we have a whole host of students who only ever take one semester of, of chemistry. So for example, uh, for whatever reason, um, our, our School of Nursing does not believe that our future nurses should have more than General Chemistry 1. Um, so they don't take general chemistry too. They don't take organic. Um, our exercise science majors are the same way. So it may be that we get one shot at this. Um, and so um, some of these students may never have the opportunity to help develop some of these strategies. And so it, it really um, speaks to how important that introductory experience is um, for, for those students. Um, so some, some good things to take away from um, the results and, and some things that we really do need to think about as um, we're thinking about instructional design and, and how to help students develop these, these important skills. Looking at the, the second question, the format. Um, so it started exactly the same way. Um, so we had our heart rate monitors, same thing, same 10 Lewis structure, uh, same 10 formulas. The students, which we were working with um, two groups, um, were randomly assigned to one treatment. So a third of the students were assigned to a group where they were asked to draw the Lewis structures with a piece of paper and a pencil. The second group used um, a, a browser-based structure drawing program called Be Socratic. Um, this is a program that, that Melanie Cooper and her group at Michigan State um, have, have developed. Um, and in this iteration, um, the students were using the program on an iPad, and they could use their finger to, to draw the structures, just like you see the, the person drawing the arrows in, in this example here. And then thirdly, um, we had a group of students um, use ChemDraw. Now, this is a structure drawing program, and at first it might seem like this is kind of weird as a, as a selection. Um, but it, one of the major publishers here in the U.S. actually uses ChemDraw um, as their structure drawing palette for Lewis structures. Um, I, I think they probably look at it as a benefit that this is a program that a lot of professional chemists, in particular organic and biochemists, use to draw structures. 
and this is getting them exposed to the program and getting them experience with it. So um, it's not as outlandish as what it might seem initially. Um, so our three groups, randomly assigned, pen and pencil, be Socratic, um, the, the chem draw. And again, we were tracking um, their heart rate as they were um, completing these activities. So here are the results. Um, again, on the y-axis here, we have our percent change in heart rate. You'll notice, as I was saying in, in response to one of the questions, um, we start with ammonia. Um, we don't have the results here for water because that was our throwaway question. That was the first one that students um, drew. Um, so we knew that their heart rate was going to be elevated because of the newness and the nervousness associated with doing the research. This also gave us the ability to make sure that, in particular for those students who were using the Socratic and ChemDraw, that we could help um, teach them how to use the program um, because there is some interface that, that's involved with it. Um, but on the x-axis we have the, the rest of the structures and then an overall average. Um, and what you'll notice is a, is a very um, nice trend. Um, these are the results for um, the organic chemistry students that were involved. Um, you'll notice that um, in every instance, um, those students who are using ChemDraw um, experienced a, a statistically significant increase um, in their heart rate in comparison to um, the students who were using either the, the pen and pencil um, or, or be Socratic. You'll notice initially um, there was a bit of difference here um, with, with be Socratic. This was probably associated with um, the newness and, and getting used to the interface, but you'll notice very, very quickly um, that corrected itself. And in some instances, um, the overall change in heart rate was, was actually a little less, though, though not significantly different from um, the the students who were using the, the piece of paper and the pencil. So what these results would seem to suggest is um, we can design instructional interfaces um, that do not um, contribute um, additional extraneous load to an already um, particularly load-inducing activity. But we have to do this very carefully, and it has to be based on what we know about how um, people learn um, and, and, and how to support that. So what, if, what have I shown? Well, hopefully I've, I've convinced you that we can um, use heart rate um, as, a, as a robust and versatile technique for, for documenting changes in cognitive load. Um, secondly, um, our studies would, would suggest that certain structural characteristics do add um, load to the problems. This appears to diminish over time um, and with experience. Um, one of the things that we're working on now is actually a, um, a scheme for characterizing um, the load of, of a Lewis structure. So we're actually using the, um, the regression analysis, the equation that comes out of that um, to, to, to predict how load-inducing um, a particular structure can be and then condensing those into discrete, discrete categories. Um, so we're in the process of doing that. Um, and this Second and thirdly, it would um, seem to suggest that the format does matter. And we need to think very carefully about the sort of in, uh, environments that we have students um, participate in. Going back to, um, I believe it was Jennifer's question about the exam. Um, thinking very carefully about how you structure your exam is, in, is important. Um, because what, what the, the cognitive load literature would seem to suggest is that um, if we have something that's particularly load inducing, um, it can impact learning not just in the moment but later on. So there's a lot of research um, that's been done in this area in economics and it might not seem particularly intuitive at first um, but then you realize that um, economists are interested in, in helping businesses sell more stuff and so if you have a menu for example at a restaurant that has 150 different items that's really load inducing Whereas if you streamline it, um, you perhaps could increase profits. So there's a lot of research that's been done in economics and into load. And one of my favorite studies um, had a title, it's called Your App Makes Me Fat. And what they did was um, they, they, they talk about um, a series of studies that were done with graduate students. And these graduate students were randomly assigned into one of two groups. So one group of graduate students 
were tasked with memorizing a two-digit number. The other group of graduate students was tasked with memorizing a seven-digit number. And when they successfully uh, memorized the number, they were then offered a, a reward. They could select either uh, from a selection of, of healthy fruit, or they could select um, a really big, beautiful piece of, of chocolate cake. Um, and what they found uh, was that graduate students that were tasked with memorizing the seven-digit number were 50% more likely to pick the piece of chocolate cake than the fruit. And so initially you say, okay, what, what in the world's going on here? Um, but what cognitive science seems to be suggesting more and more is that we have this um, pulled resource um, that, that all cognitive processes um, are, are being deri uh, driven from. And so, yes, we have what we would consider to be cognitive tasks, where I ask the student to draw a Lewis structure. So every time I do that, the pull um, is, is depleted a little bit. But it's, it goes well beyond that. So not just cognitive tasks like that, but attention. So all of you hopefully are, are paying attention to what I'm saying. That's, that's draining your cognitive research pool right now. Willpower. Every time you have to exercise willpower, it drains the cognitive research or resource pool just a little bit. Every time you have to make a decision, it drains the pool. Every time you have to exercise self-control, it drains the pool. So the, the point here is, if, if you've completely overwhelmed the student from a poorly designed exam or, or an interface on, a, on an online homework system that, that um, is increasing the amount of extraneous load, not only are you um, impacting learning in and of the moment, but then you're, you're, you're impacting this decision-making process, their ability for, to, to exercise self-control or willpower, their ability to pay attention down the road. Right? So again, this goes to this idea that we need to think very, very, very carefully about um, these sorts of instructional choices that we're making. The last thing I'll say, um, and then we'll, we'll have a few more minutes for questions, is just to give you a glimpse of what we're currently working on. One of the great things about this approach, um, and, and it's great to see how this has evolved over time, if you look at pictures of people who were doing cognitive load research with, um, by measuring physiological metrics in, in the 1970s or 80s, um, the, the, the people were all hooked up to these wires and, and electrodes, and, um, and so, but that's no longer the case. The, as I was saying before, these heart rate monitors um, even some EEGs are completely wireless. Um, and so we've been studying students, um, as, as Melanie Cooper would say, in the wild. Um, so in um, their actual lecture. And so we identified a group of four um, organic chemistry students, and we've followed them through um, their chemistry, organic chemistry lectures. So we hooked them up with heart rate monitors at the beginning of, of each lecture. Um, they went sat down wherever they wanted, they, they, they learned um, for the day, they participated in class discussions, things like that. Um, and at the same time that we were recording their heart rate, we were also videotaping what was going on. And so we could then, um, this is an example of, of data from a, from a particular day. Um, what we could do is, um, okay, so at this point in time, it looks like blue is spiking. So what's going on at this particular moment in class um, that perhaps could be causing blue to spike? Here, here's another one out here. Um, and so here are some examples that are um, associated with those spikes. So at this particular time in the lecture, they were learning about aromaticity. They were learning about frost diagrams and how to go about doing those, um, talking about the, the um, the non-planar nature of um, cyclooctatetraene and, and why that's important for avoiding anti-aromaticity. Um, and so what we've been doing is creating um, not just a, a list of content that seems to be load-inducing. So this is an example here. Um, you'll notice that um, 10 topics um, in from Organic Chemistry 2 um, look to be responsible for almost two-thirds of the spikes in, in cognitive load. So we're doing that not just by topic, but also um, looking at what, what sort of activities were students doing at this particular point in time? Were, were they talking about mechanisms? 
were they being expected to um, look at synthesis or um, problem solving? Were they working together in groups? Things like that. So we're still in the process of, of analyzing that information. Um, so with that, um, I, I want to, to thank um, my students again, um, Katija and Ryan, Andrew, um, all of them. Um, they have been incredibly helpful in, in, in helping with, with this research. Um, and again, thank you very much to, to Michael uh, for the, the invitation and for all of you um, tuning in today. So um, if there are more questions, I'd, I'd be happy to answer those at this point. Yeah, thank you very much. It was a really interesting talk, and, and there are so many questions. I'm not going to be able to ask all of them, so I apologize to people that I don't. Oh, and, 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 and if, I, if I, sorry, if I could, if, if I don't get to your question and, and it's burning, feel free to, to shoot me an email, and I'm more than happy to, to, to engage um, outside of the, the, the conference. So um. Fabulous. Thank you. Um, a few people very jealous or, or very envious of the number of people you got to participate in the study. Um, they're wondering how you managed to recruit them, how you um, induce them to do it, and also the kind of ethics, ethical approval you had to go through the process with the physiological me uh, measurement. Right. So first, um, important to point out that, that all of our studies are, are approved by um, our institutional review board. Um, they, they look at the, the, the format of, of what we're intending to do in the methods um, and, and make sure that we're not doing things that, that are unethical. One of the things that we have to do that's special um, in this case is if the students um, pick up on, and now I'm talking about my research students, pick up on uh, very high instances of heart rate, um, we are to actually alert the students to that um, and encourage them to um, seek out medical attention um, and, and uh, we offer to take them to the, the student health center if they want to do that. We, we've never had to do that, um, but all of this work has been um, approved by our institutional review board. As far as participation, um, I, I guess I'll just say we, we, we get lucky. Um, we don't um, I don't think in any one of these studies um, have we given them any sort of, of physical benefit. Um, there, there's been no extra credit um, or, or um, payment of any sort. These, these are students that are just willing to, um, to participate. And, and, and it's been really great in that regard. That, that last bit that I was talking about just very briefly you know, we, we collected data from students over the course of well over 50 lectures, um, and, and they never once complained. Um, they were really great sports about it. Um, I think part of it is that it's, it's not a terribly intrusive process, um, and it's something that, that students are very comfortable with. Um, we're all much more connected now than, than what we've been in the past. You know, I'm, I'm sitting here with my Apple Watch. It's, it's monitoring my heart rate as we speak. Um, students use these um, sort of devices as they're um, exercising. There are now EEGs that are commercially available to help pe uh, people with meditation. Um, so I think these sorts of, of physiological, th this, this data is something that people are becoming much more attuned to and, and much more comfortable with. So we've just been very lucky that, that students have been willing to participate. So. Thank you. Yeah, you, you have. And it, it, it was wonderful to see so much participation. So thank you for sharing. Just as a, I, I assume I'll have to wrap up soon, but we had a bit of a, a discussion um, in the background about the um, of the responses. Did you have any um, students that, or, or participants that were particularly confident? So they appeared to have very low cognitive load, but then they gave you the incorrect answers. Did you dismiss incorrect answers? Did you wait until the answers were, that were given were correct? How did you differentiate? Right. So in, in, the, in the studies that I've described, we've never particularly cared about whether the answer is correct or not. Um, because ultimately, we're interested in um, what they think the answer is. Um, I, can, I can tell you that we have looked um, at the connection between the, the load and whether the answer is correct or not. 
Um, and there, there is there are small correlations that that exist there, um, but but I don't think we would expect anything else than that. There, there's a lot that goes into determining whether the answer a student creates is correct, and and load is is one factor um, and an important factor, but not the only factor. Um, so we've we've really not paid a, a huge amount of attention to is it correct or not. So. Okay, thank you. And um, could I just ask one final question on the um, exams, just to go back to the, the questions earlier about exam stress. Um, right. Do you have any evidence that, that, that students when they're stressed actually have reduced working memory um, other times? And, and are there some students where the, the working memory is more reduced than for others by stress, or, or is it not a factor? Uh, I, I I, just to be honest, I don't I don't feel comfortable um, commenting on that because I don't know if we have any data that we've gathered that would say one way or the other. Um, okay. So it, it, it I don't know is is the okay. is the answer. No, that's fair enough. Um, just a couple of one more on the. Um, do you want me to finish now, Michael? Uh, we'll take one more question, I think, and then we should probably yeah. wrap up. Okay. Um, Alison was, was interested to know whether you found that the participants characterised the structures in the same way that you did. Do you think that's that's the way that they viewed them? Um, did they have a similar approach or did they have the approach that you expected to have them to have? Um, so we've done some work in this, this area. Um, this is actually some of the, the work that, that I did as a postdoc with, with Melanie. Um, I think what we saw was uh, certainly the students had, in many cases, very different approaches um, to creating the structures and, and categorizing the structures. Um, though I would say that there were um, a number of instances where we saw faculty doing things that were um, eerily similar um, to what the, the students were doing. Um, so in, in many ways, I would say no, that, that the, the students and the, and the experts are um, probably doing things a bit differently than what we would anticipate. Um, so. Thank you. Thanks very much. And I'm going to hand over to Michael now. Thank you. Thank you, Nikki. And, and yes, Nathan, just to echo Nikki's thanks. It's, uh, I mean, the volume of correspondence in the chat room you probably haven't seen. It's just been a really uh, fantastic talk, both in terms of an exemplary research approach, which I think we can all learn from, and um, the results themselves are obviously so interesting and the methods of use. So thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And of course, thanks to Nikki as well. And I'm sure people will um, present their virtual applause. Um, just to say that our next webinar in the series will be um, Don Wink next um, month. Um, I heard this, well, a version of this talk at Gordon Serp last year. It was just absolutely outstanding. Um, again, very similar to Nathan talking about the process, the methodological process, but also what, what this means in terms of teaching for learning chemistry. So I do uh, invite you all to join that webinar and to join me in thanking Nikki and especially Nathan for a really fantastic um, hour. So thank you all very much for joining us all over the world. Okay, good night, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Nathan. That was amazing. Yeah, wow. Thank really you. Really fantastic work. Yeah. So, so the reference you had for the book chapter, I might, I might put that on the website because I think a lot of people will be interested in, in chasing that up. That's an, that's an extra, that's a new mention to the work. I think is quite interesting. Yeah, we we also have a, a JCE paper that's um, under review um, that that talks about that second study. Um, yeah, we've got to do some work on it, but um, so yeah. I, I, it, was, it was only really when I was going through your slides, I realized how clever this heart rate system is because, as you say, it's not big wires, I think, anymore. It's something quite um, yeah. intrusive. So I guess students after a while just forget they're wearing it or, or as, well, I mean, perhaps even we're moving into an era where everybody just wears Fitbits and, and you know, we get the data that way. Well, that, that that's absolutely true. And and the, the students who participated in the, um, you know, that long, um, sort of case study that we did with organic, 
there were several of them that reached the point um, where they actually forgot they were wearing it and, and left the class and, and then had to come back um, and give it to us later in the afternoon. So, you know, I think that's really good evidence to, suggest, to, to really support how unobtrusive the, the, the technology can be. Um, and it's great to see that we've gotten to that point. So, um, yeah. Well, I wish you continued success with really interesting work and look forward to following and it's really been very useful to both my own research but I think to a, just in terms of to a lot of people in terms of um, your very rigorous systematic approach to doing this research the validation studies followed by the actual research approach I think was really useful so on behalf of Sarah thank you very much and hopefully on behalf of myself thank you very much for your time. My pleasure it, 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 as I said it, it was an honor to, to be able to do this so thank you. Well. That's great. So I, I'm going to um, sign off. So uh, whenever you, whenever you're happy to leave, you, if you, you should be able to scroll back through the chat messages if you want to make any notes. And um, I'll, I'll be in touch just to thank you by distance. So all the best and enjoy the rest of your afternoon as it is over there. Well, thank you very much, Michael. Okay. Take care.